but let's pray as we open God's word together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity we've had over this term to hear your words through the Apostle Paul from 1 and 2 Timothy. And as we reach the end of this series today, we pray that uh, we would still find more insight as we dig deep uh, into uh, this pastoral letter. And we pray we would help our hearts to be open and receptive to your spirit working in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we are looking at our final chapter of 2 Timothy, under the heading of Passing on the Gospel Torch. As I mentioned in the children's talk a little earlier, handouts are things that are very important. I think back to when I was leaving uh, my teaching job in New Zealand in 2018. There was a brand new teacher straight out of Teachers College that was coming to replace me. And I got given two days to spend with him to share all of my knowledge on the subject of economics and business and all of the ins and outs of how to survive in a school of 1,400 uh, students. And we had a really important time together trying to hand over the key information that he would need to go on and be successful in his role. Well, as we approach this final chapter, there's also a sense here that a final handover is happening. The Apostle Paul is in jail in Rome, and any day he is expecting to come before Caesar and be put to death. So he's written this letter to pass the gospel torch on to Timothy, a young man who he has mentored for many years, and for a final time to encourage and equip him for the job that lay ahead of him of shepherding the church at Ephesus. So as we come into chapter 4, we see three requests uh, from Paul that we've turned into the three points today. To preach or proclaim the word, to come together, and to remember the whole church family. So let's look again at verse 1 in chapter 4. Proclaim the word. Here Paul writes, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. The gospel message matters because of Jesus. Paul reminds both Timothy and us about who Jesus is. He's not just a good teacher from Galilee, who provided an example of how to live well. No, Jesus is God himself. And although Jesus is well, most well known for his crucifixion, he is not dead. God raised him back to life, and Jesus has ascended into heaven in power and glory. During Jesus' earthly ministry, he announced the beginning of the kingdom of God. And as Paul reminds Timothy, he will return on the last day to judge the sinful world and to bring in God's perfected eternal kingdom. The writings of the Gospel and the rest of the New Testament tell us just how glorious this new kingdom will be. No more sin, no more suffering, worship with the people of God from every generation, always been in the presence of God. And it also gives us a strong warning that only people who confess their sin and trust by faith in Jesus' blood to forgive them will enter. People who trust in their own good deeds and righteousness, or those who ignore God's call on their lives altogether, will face eternity separated from God's glory and favour in hell. Like Timothy, we live in this in-between time. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, and we do see the kingdom of God growing in the world. Yet we also live in a place where Satan and his kingdom of darkness still try and enslave people and draw them away from the light of God. So God has given us this opportunity at this point to reach out to others, to remind them of his eternal kingdom 
and to point them to the mercy and grace of Jesus at the cross. So this is the context Paul has for Timothy when he charges him and us to preach or proclaim the words of the gospel message. Coming down to verse 2, we see his focus is on when to proclaim the word. He says, be prepared in season and out of season. Paul urges Timothy to proclaim the word when the harvest is ripe, as it is at the moment for many of our farmers. In the spiritual setting, this is where the Holy Spirit is really stirring revival, where people are longing to be fed with God's word. Seasons of growth in the church, when people want to come, when they want to hear, and they want to grow together. But, as Paul reminds Timothy, there are also times when people are uninterested in Jesus, when they stop coming to church, when they don't want your prayers, when they mock and they ridicule the Christian faith. There are seasons for us as well where we feel ready to share about God's blessings. And then there are other seasons for us where we struggle with burdens and we feel we're distant from God. Yet every time is the right time for us to come back and use God's word to proclaim it to others. Next, Paul turns to how to use this word. He instructs Timothy to use it to correct, to rebuke, and to encourage God's people with great patience and with careful instruction. The word translated preach here in English is a word in Greek used for heralding or proclaiming. So it's really helpful just to clarify here that it's not our message that we're passing on. It's what God, through his Spirit, has already revealed to us in Scripture. We are like the megaphone or the sound system. Our job is to amplify what is already present. God's Word, as we saw last week, is sufficient. It has all we need for salvation. It tells us who God is. It tells us who we are. It tells us of God's plan to redeem us and how we should live in the light of his mercy and grace. While there are some areas where Christians interpret parts of the Bible differently, this is not what Paul's addressing here. The correction is for people who abandon the core gospel message. The message that people are by nature sinful and deserving of God's judgment, that they cannot save themselves, but that God himself, in the person of Jesus, entered our world, proclaimed a new kingdom, lived the perfect life of righteousness we couldn't, and willingly gave himself to die in our place as a sacrifice for our sin. And in rising again, showed he defeated Satan and is now seated in heaven. We know that soon Christ will return to judge this world and bring about his eternal kingdom, where people from every culture and language who confess their sin and put their faith in him will enjoy the abundant life of God forever. It's in the light of this amazing gift God offers us that we seek to imitate and reflect Jesus' holiness rather than pure lives. We don't do this to save ourselves, but out of gratitude and in worship for what he has done. These are the non-negotiables of the Bible that Paul is trying to impress on Timothy. Most of us have seen people who have walked away from these core truths. They start selectively choosing the bits of the Bible that they want to apply to them and discard the bits that are deemed as no longer applicable. Paul encourages us here that the loving thing to do when a person is drifting towards danger is to encourage them to turn around. It is important that it's done in a God-honouring way. He says in verse 2, with great patience, we're not to be rash or angry. We're never going to shout someone into the kingdom of God. 
He cautions Timothy to use careful instruction. We should be in prayer with spirit's wisdom and guidance. We should seek the advice of others about the best way to share the good news. Yet Paul is not saying that the Bible is just for negative contexts. It's not just about rebuking. It's also about encouraging. And if you're feeling discouraged this morning, I'd like to point out to you that if you have accepted Jesus by faith, you have been adopted into the family of God. There is a seat at God's table with your name on it. Even when you wrestle with sin, Jesus has paid for it all. There is no debt that you owe. When you feel exhausted, you feel like you're wasting away, just like Paul does in the later verses. The great news is, Jesus promises that your suffering is temporary, and that you will spend all eternity in a perfect body that will never wear out. Which is great news, especially this week I've had to go to the chiropractor and the dentist, and next week I'm going back to both of those places. So I cannot wait for the new body to arrive. <laughs> and in our age of rising prices, it's encouraging for us to remember that there is no amount of inflation that is ever going to erode the treasure that is stored in heaven Amen. for God's beloved children. Amen. In the following two verses, Paul explains to Timothy why he needs to proclaim this gospel. <laughs> he points out that people even people in the church, even in leadership positions in the church, will turn away from the sound doctrine taught by Jesus and the apostles and instead gather around them teachers who tell them lies and myths that they want to hear. This is the sad reality that we face. All of us are tempted by our sinful nature to desire and to lust after the very things the Bible warns us about. And in our internet age, it is easier than ever to find people who teach exactly what our itching ears want to hear. If you don't want to believe what the passage in the Bible is saying, there is another opinion out there. And it will mirror your own, and you can ally with it. For many... When the truth of the Bible becomes uncomfortable, they choose to suppress it and cling to alternative facts or myths, as Paul puts it, which align with their views. Today, we have a great number of people out there saying things like, this life is all that there is, so go out, make as much money as you can, and just enjoy yourself. Yet Jesus says in Matthew 6, Verse 19 to 20, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Others say, we're never going to have to answer to God. Jesus says in Luke 12, verse 5, fear him, in God, who after your body has been killed has the authority to throw you into hell. Others say, well, God loves everyone. He doesn't care if I keep on sinning. Jesus says in Luke 13, 5, unless you repent, you too will perish. And another popular one these days is, well, there are just many ways to God. Jesus is one way, but all the other religions, they have legitimate ways too. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We need to be careful with what these teachers are saying. We live in a culture today that encourages us to be proud in who we are. However, it's this very pride inherent in our sinful nature that wants a God that aligns exactly to our worldview rather than humbly acknowledging our need for God to shape and mold us. This is why it's so important for us to be able to all 66 books of the Bible and have them preached and read 
and listened and meditated on chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We especially need the parts that make us feel uncomfortable and unsettled because we need to humble ourselves and let God's word change us rather than us just selectively choose the parts of God's word that suit our agendas. Some people like Timothy have been called to do the work of an evangelist or the work of a teaching pastor. And looking down to verse 5, it says, Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Paul is encouraging us yeah, to remember those people and to, I think, to pray for them to faithfully discharge their duties. As a congregation, we need to pray for Sam as our pastor and for the other ministers and evangelists in our town to be faithful in discharging their duties. The preaching and pastoral work they do has a crucially important role in the health of our church. Yet they don't do it alone. All believers are called to proclaim what God has done in our lives to others and pass on that good news. So every Christian, all of us here today, are called to be like Timothy, to keep our heads and to faithfully proclaim God's truth. This is not always easy. It's not always fruitful. It may lead to others directing hate <laughs> towards us. But it is the right thing to do. Here we have Paul about to die exclusively because he has taken this gospel stand. And yet he has absolutely no regrets. The number one piece of wisdom he wants to pass on to the next generation is to keep firm in the gospel and keep passing it on. What better privilege can we have than standing with Paul and pointing others to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life? Our church family... Our community need to hear this clear gospel truth because there are so many sources offering them dangerous lies. I encourage you, you've been placed here for a reason. Proclaim the good news. The second main request we see in our next, is in our next point. Come quickly or come together. The second main request that Paul makes to Timothy is in verse 9. Here he pleads with him to do your best to come to me quickly. It was heading into winter. The window for safe sea travel across the Mediterranean was closing. Paul knew that only too well from his experiences where he got shipwrecked in Malta from taking a ship too late. And Paul's imminent execution meant there was real urgency for Timothy to leave quickly. Paul was in a really challenging time. He goes on to say, key people who had been supporting him were no longer around. And he just longed for the encouragement and the companionship that Timothy would provide. In verse 10, Paul writes that Demas deserted him and left Rome for Thessalonica. This must have been a real crushing blow to him. <laughs> To have someone who he was closely mentoring, in a way similar to Timothy, turn around and then make the active choice to embrace a worldly lifestyle and walk away from the faith. Adding to Paul's sense of loss was the dispersion of other key team members to take up ministry roles in other places. Although Paul must have sensed the Spirit was sending them out, and he would have been glad for the communities they went to, he was still grieving the hole they left behind in his life. Cretans is now in Galatia, or central Turkey. Titus is in Dalmatia, modern-day Croatia. Tychicus is off to Ephesus in western Turkey. Erastus has gone to Corinth in southern Greece. Trophimus was left unwell in Miletus, Near emphasis, so the team is really spread out. Paul was already feeling in a tough place. He mentions that he was being poured out like a drink offering. 
And that he was facing the fury of the Roman Emperor Nero, who in verse 17 he refers to as a lion, escaping from the lion's mouth. This, compounded by the emotional hardship of losing the majority of his close friends, left him very vulnerable. Of the original group he arrived in Rome with, now only Luke was left. When I first entered teaching just over 10 years ago, I was told that to survive as a teacher, you needed to have at least one close teaching friend on staff with you. That friend would help with joy and resilience. I've found those words quite pathetic. In the jobs I've had since, a close friend has been so essential. Someone who could pray with me during hard times, someone who would advocate on my behalf when needed, and someone who knew when extra work was put on my plate and would work out ways to share it with me. So I can understand Paul's desire here to have Timothy, someone who trusts and who's worked closely with him, to help him as he manages the last days of his life. God has made us for community. In Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about how the church, just like our human body, is made up of many different parts that need each other. In the same way our body needs both eyes and hands to work, we need the gifts of the wider body of believers to support, to encourage, to train and correct each other in our journeys through this world. Although Paul is confident God's going to bring them safely into his heavenly kingdom, even if Paul is standing alone, this will still be true, and that God will provide support and strength, it is natural for him, as it is for us, to reach out to dear friends for support. It's not just friendship that Paul's after as well. As we go on, we see he also wants practical help. Down in verse 13, we see there are two particular items he wants brought with Timothy. His cloak and his parchments. Now, I'm told that Rome is very cold in winter regularly plunging below zero degrees. And Paul is now an elderly man. He's in prison cells. He rightly wants the comfort of being able to stay physically warm during this time. He also wants spiritual encouragement from his parchments and his scrolls. <laughs> we don't know whether these scrolls are Old Testament scripture writings about Jesus or correspondence he's had with other churches and other Christians could be all three. But whatever they do contain, Paul wants to find comfort in rereading them again before his death. It's helpful for us to see here that if Paul could find great value with his infinite knowledge, or seemingly infinite knowledge about God's word, in reading and rereading what's been written about God, we should too. We can never read the Bible too many times. And in verse 12, he asks Timothy to bring another fellow, sorry, verse 11, to bring another fellow co-worker with him, Mark. He says, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. In these words, we see the transformative power of the gospel to heal divisions and to bring forgiveness and reconciliation to fractured human relationships. Mark had previously offended Paul greatly. He had caused great sadness when he, similar to Demas, had deserted Paul and Barnabas on an earlier missionary journey. Later, Barnabas had tried to get Mark to rejoin a future missionary journey with Paul. And Paul had objected to Mark's coming so strongly that Barnabas and Paul split up and went separate ways. Yet here, many years later, as he sits in his prison cell, Paul is now ready to embrace the very same man he refused to work with in the past. 
Mark has gone from being a liability to a great power. I don't think Paul could possibly have known just how helpful Mark would be to the church because early church tradition tells us that it was Mark travelling to Rome and spending time with the Apostle Peter there that led to the Gospel of Mark that we have in our Bibles. But the Holy Spirit was at work in this situation, healing the divisions between two believers and preparing them to work together. The harsh reality of working together and living in a community with other Christians is that we will hurt each other. We will offend each other. There will be mistrust. Even small differences, like differences in opinion over building design or the way to run a church service, causes relationships to be strained. Yet here, in the willingness of Paul to reconcile, we see the pattern for how we should approach Christian relationships. It doesn't happen instantly. It often will require mediation with other believers. But as Christians, we are called to forgive each other, as Christ has forgiven us, and to leave the past behind us as we work together for a common God, which is to see the gospel of faith and proclaimed. In his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Jesus challenges us with these words. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with him, then come and offer your gift. My prayer for all of our church community is that we will be filled with unity and respect for each other. That we are a place where unsettled grievances are not left to fester, where we will work together for peace, myself included. We come on now to our final point. There's past my greetings on there, but I would say remember the whole church family. In the final verses of the book, with all of the lovely names that Steve was reading earlier, we read of Paul's final request of Timothy to exchange greetings with other believers in Ephesus. Here he asks for Timothy to greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Anisiphorus. He also passes on the greetings of Eubulus, Cludens, Linus, Claudia, and all the other brothers and sisters. The word in the Greek used for greetings is more than just the word g'day. It has a real sense of respect that comes along with it. Although we know almost none of these people from any other place, these verses are important. And they show that all of us have a role to play in the family of God. It is not just the leaders or old friends like Priscilla and Aquila who Paul wants to greet. He's also passing on messages from Eubulus, Prudens, Linus and Claudius in the whole of the Roman church. These are people who are not mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, neither are members of Anisiphorus' household. But their lives mattered to Paul. Their lives mattered to Timothy. Their lives mattered to the Lord Jesus, who died so that their names would be written in his book of life. Isn't it significant that the last thing that is recorded for Paul to say is to share his greetings with the brothers and sisters of Christ for one final time? And this greeting that he passed on is in verse 22. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And this, this year was a plural. It's not just grace be with Timothy, it's grace be with all of the brothers and sisters of God. Well, when I think of my time in this church, I am very grateful for the ministry of pastors. We were remembering Bill Miller earlier this morning. We also think of pastors David Knott and Sam Hurd here recently. 
But we've been blessed by so many others as well. And as I was preparing for this, I was thinking of some of the members of this church now in aged care who are unable to worship with us in person. I was thinking about Lottie and her jams for mission, and Olive and her painting of church property, and her morning teas, and her cleaning, and her enthusiasm for encouraging others, and thinking of Joan and her warm hospitality. I could go on and on. I personally have grown a lot from many of you here as well. And one of the things I've found more challenging about the church's rapid growth over the past year and a half is it becomes difficult to know everyone and to uh, have that relationship in the way that it's easier when you have a smaller group of people. But there is so much value in getting to know others and supporting them in their Christian walk. So my encouragement to you this morning is to invest in relationships with people across every generation of our church, from our youngest children and babies right up to our members in their 80s and 90s. It's a joy to be mutually encouraging to one another and to pass on God's grace. This is the church being the community that God designed for it to be. So in conclusion, as we reflect together on this handover from Paul to Timothy, there are three key messages for us to take away. That we would be bold in proclaiming the gospel, using the words of the Bible, and taking that to review, correct and encourage one another. For us to support, encourage and forgive each other as we do gospel ministry. And finally, for us to remember and seek to bless all of our brothers and sisters in the faith. <laughs> Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you how your word is relevant for us today, just as it was relevant for Timothy. And we pray, Lord, that we wouldn't have proud hearts that just seek to conform uh, what you say to our thinking, but that you would really challenge us to change our approach based on the revealed words of Scripture. Lord, help us to be a congregation that is centred on the Gospel and that seeks to reach out to others through the Gospel. Lord, we pray that you would help us to stay a united community. Help us to be effective and working together as believers. And may we be of great encouragement in our spiritual world. Lord, we thank you that you died for us so that we could have life. And we just pray that together we would experience fullness of joy as we live the Christian life together. Looking forward to when you return and we can spend eternity in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. We are on to our final song now. It's made in mind of Christ. <laughs>